is Corey Miller, and you're watching the TV Writer Podcast. Hosted by Gray Jones, the TV Writer Podcast is brought to you by Script Magazine and ScriptMag.com, the leading source for script writing information in print and on the web. And by Final Draft Script Writing Software, the entertainment industry standard for script writing worldwide. My name is Gray Jones, and I want to welcome you to the TV Writer Podcast, partner of Script Magazine, episode 18 for Monday, April 18th, 2011. You know, there's a word in the English language that is very unique, and that word is juggernaut. How would you define the word juggernaut? One definition could be a powerful force that defies opposition. Another way of defining juggernaut may be, well... C-S-I, N-C-I-S. Yep, a powerful force that defies opposition. These shows have spawned no a number of offshoots. They dominate the ratings. Um, they just take a licking and keep on ticking. And so I thought it'd be great if we would find out a little bit behind the curtain of these shows. And I'm so excited that today I have an interview with writer, producer, Corey Miller, who has worked on a number of these shows from CSI to CSI Miami, NCIS, and also other shows like Body of Proof and even Lois and Clark. Uh, so it's going to be a very, very exciting interview. You're going to have a lot of fun today. Before we get to that interview, th though, I do want to remind you of a few things. One of them is the homework that's on the table. Small Screen Big Picture by Chad Gervich. This is an excellent, excellent resource about working in Hollywood and not just working in Hollywood, but just how the Hollywood system works. If you've ever been confused about ratings, if you've ever been confused about the development process, about how something goes from idea through the often two-year process to getting onto the screen, uh, why certain shows are canceled and other shows aren't, uh, it's a tremendous, tremendous book. Under $11, you can get it at tvwriterpodcast.com. Click on the store menu. And when you do click on that store menu, stop there because there are also many audiobooks now. This is a new feature at tvwriterpodcast.com. Uh, the reality is that with many of our schedules, we don't get as much reading time as we would like. Uh, I personally have found tremendous value in audiobooks. I've listened to Robert McKee's story probably six or seven times um, just as I exercise or as I'm on my commute. And you may find that there's a lot of time that you're not using well, there's almost 30 audiobooks there that you can choose from, and every time you do, you will help to support the podcast with your purchase. So they're very economical and a great way to maximize on your time. And also, it's, it's, um, it's really interesting that you do learn differently between reading and hearing. And so sometimes I will actually read a book and also listen to the audiobook so that I can get both perspectives on the material. And, and when I'm out on a walk and, and I'm listening to it, I find that, that I think about it in a much different way. So definitely take advantage of that resource. There's going to be some more audiobooks added as we go from audible.com. And so um, that's a great new feature. But do, once you're on that page, there's, there's links that you can click to the TV Writer Podcast mini Amazon store, the U.S. version or the Canadian version. And you can get great books there, including... Uh, small screen, big picture, and you can help support the podcast as you do. And also, while you're on the site, make sure you check out the TV Writer Twitter database, which is now over 700 TV writers and continues to climb. One of the writers on that list that you definitely want, want to follow is me, Gray Jones. Um, you can follow me at Gray Jones, and uh, you can find out about more great writers that are coming. Uh, I've actually booked a number of new ones. I was just at the um, Toronto Screenwriting Conference this last weekend and booked a number of new exciting interviews for the coming months. So definitely follow me on Twitter and watch for that so you can get your questions answered. Uh, if you don't get a chance to go to those kinds of conferences, this is a great way that you can interact with writers and get your questions answered. Uh, speaking about questions, if you have any questions or comments about the podcast, you can send an email to mail at tvwriterpodcast.com. And also remember to check out our partner, Script Magazine, at scriptmag.com for lots of helpful resources. And hey, their digital subscriptions are really inexpensive. Uh, check those out. They, they give you free access to over six years of digital back issues. 
Very, very cool. Well, I'm going to move on to writer-producer Corey Miller. Uh, he's a very funny writer, as you'll see from the bio he sent me. I'm going to read that now, so we'll get a little bit of a um, context for his interview, and then we'll roll on to his interview. Corey Miller has been interested in the entertainment business since he was a child, much to his mother's and often his own chagrin. After holding an ungodly number of production assistant, production coordinator, and then writer's assistant positions, he got hired as the assistant to the showrunner on the television show CSI. After impressing his boss, i.e., bugging her until she relented, he got the chance to write a freelance episode. Later hired as a staff writer on CSI Miami, he eventually rose the ranks to supervising producer, writing or co-writing another 22 episodes along the way. His other writing credits include the indie film Border to Border and episodes of the series The Forgotten and NCIS Los Angeles, and recently sold a spec pilot to the Peter Chernin Company and Fox. He is currently a writer and co-executive producer on the new ABC series body of proof. Corey is not ashamed to admit that he's an L.A. native. Like I said, he's a very, very funny writer. And just like his bio, our interview was a lot of fun. You'll find not only some great stories about working his way up in Hollywood, but also some great lessons about thinking outside the box and making the most of every opportunity. You can follow Corey on Twitter at Too Much Fire. Without further ado, we're going to roll on my interview with writer-producer Corey Miller. Enjoy. This is Gray, and I'm here with writer-producer Corey Miller. How are you doing, Corey? I'm great, thanks. Thanks for having me on the show. Well, I, I really appreciate you taking the time because I, I know that there are some really exciting shows that you've been a part of, and uh, we'll get to all that fun stuff, but we'd like to go all the way back to the beginning. And uh, and now you're another L.A. boy. I am, yes. I think there are about three or four of us out here that um, <laughs> work in the business that actually were raised in the area. <laughs> yeah. So where did you grow up? I grew up around the Pasadena area, not too far away from the from the you know hustle and bustle of Hollywood, but um, just enough where I, I had no idea that the entertainment business kind of existed you know in my area it, it, uh i had no um no relatives that worked in the business or anything i but i i did kind of have a fascination with it from early on so it was it was fun to be able to um to kind of go visit the places that i i wanted to see when i was growing up mm -hmm. so where did you go to school um, high school i went to temple city high school mm -hmm. little high school kind of by the santa anita racetrack and when school when college came up i i really set my sights on ucla and i did not get in I ended up at USC, for, and I went there for two years. I applied a couple times to get into the film school unsuccessfully. Mm -hmm. and so because I didn't want to spend any more money there, I um, I just said, you know what, I'd rather just kind of get a degree and just start working. So I transferred out of USC, and I finished up my last my last two years at um, Cal State Northridge, mm -hmm. where I got a film and television degree there. I, you know, I set my sights in, in high school on wanting to, to be in, in film and television, so I, I did know at a very early enough age. Now, did you know at that point uh, exactly what you wanted to do? I think I've known since I was about 10 or 11 what I wanted to do, which I'm, I feel really lucky for, that and that fact that I knew that and my parents could could kind of foster that in me. You know, my dad would drive me out to Hollywood and we'd see TV show tapings and oh, you know, the cool. Universal Studios lot. You know, that's what I mean about the access was great, to be able to have the access to be able to drive to these places and, and see, you know, kind of some of the how things work and and so my parents were great in always fostering my interest in in um, television it wasn't that i set out to be a writer or something i just wanted to be a part of it somehow i didn't really know what capacity per se but it wasn't until college kind of opened my eyes a lot as far as just film history and and things that really got me even more excited about just you know what cinema has done over the past you know 100 plus years and it just um but still even in college i wasn't exactly sure what i wanted to do i had leaned toward editing at the time Actually, when when I was in high school, mm -hmm. we had a very a very limited production program. Actually, it was, there was a film class that you could take. I decided at that point I wanted to be an editor, so I would uh, make video yearbooks up for the school. So we'd go around. Some of us in the class would go out and film all the events and things at the school that we could, and we tried to represent as many of the student population as we could. And then I edited all the footage into a, about a 12-minute video, music video, and we sold it for as part of the kind of a fundraiser. Oh, cool. That was, that was kind of got me excited, you know, getting getting into editing and and so in college, I, I first I thought, well, I'm going to be an editor. So I, when I took film classes and things, I, whenever we had a, a, a film to make, I usually ended up becoming the editor. And so I edited a few projects in college. Mm -hmm. 
at what point did you switch over to thinking you wanted to write? Um, actually, it wasn't until I got my first legitimate paying job. <laughs> when, um, I was lucky enough, when I was in, um, finishing up Cal State Northridge, I wanted to get an internship. And now internships seem very common. But um, at the time, they weren't as widely known, I guess, that you should do an internship. And so I just decided one day, you know, I really want an internship. I want to start kind of getting my foothold in this business. And this is about a year. I still have a year left of, of college. So I, I just picked up one of those Hollywood creative directories and I just went through it page by page and I just started highlighting people that I really respected and I wanted to work for. This is like the kind of youthful naivete, I guess, that gets you through. But <laughs> so at the time I, I was thinking, okay, directors, I really like Tim Burton. I like Oliver Stone, you know, some people like that. And so I just started calling them, cold calling them and just saying, hey, do you need an intern? And, and, <laughs> and, and actually one of the first calls I made was to Oliver Stone's office and they said, yes, in fact, we do need an intern. So really, I, I, I got a job interning at Oliver Stone's office and that wow. was my, my kind of first <clears throat> first taste of um, the industry. And it was amazing. You know, I, I worked there you know, maybe 12 to 15 hours a week or so. They were you know, very flexible with the schedule and I um, got credit for it at school. And I really kind of got my first foray into the into the business, and you know I got to read a lot of scripts and, and um, answer a lot of phone calls, talk to a lot of interesting people, and a lot of filmmakers and actors would come by the office, and that was it was really you know it was really interesting, and it was a great experience. And they they actually gave me my my first job, um, my first paying job, and this I still wasn't I still not graduated from college yet, but there was this mini series called Wild Palms mm -hmm. that um, I was a, a production assistant on, so they kind of helped me get into that they produced that that mini series so uh, that was my first real job and then that was you know it was rough i was thinking wow this is my first you know again i wasn't really sure what i wanted to do yet i um, just loved being on the set in fact i was an extra in college too just to kind of see what was going on on the set you know not to <clears throat> just watch the director work and to see how things you know transpired on a day-to-day -day basis but mm -hmm. when uh, when um this wild palm show you know, we worked, it was about three and a half months of my life and, and I worked 90 hours a week or so. And I kept thinking, wow, do I really want to be in this business after all? <laughs> but, um, again, it was eye opening. I worked in the location department and worked on the, on the set and, and in the office as well. And so that was a crash course right there. And, and it still fueled me to keep going. And, um, after that was over, I finished up my last semester of school. Then I just had to pound the pavement again for a job. I, there were about three or four months after I graduated college where I, I did not have a, a job. I worked at Bank of America and was just trying to send out resumes as much as I could. And the first job that I, I got after college was um, as a production assistant on Lois and Clark, mm -hmm. which was at Warner Brothers um, on ABC at the time. So and that that job was it was during that that time that I focused in on writing. I believe it was. I, I was always a fan of Superman and comic books when I was a kid, and mm -hmm. and just um, seeing the scripts kind of you know come out and read them, and I just kept thinking. It seems a little more tangible to me now. I, I, maybe before writing seemed like an intangible goal or something, because I, I did always like to write, and I wrote creative writing stories and poetry through my life. And so it was that at that point when I I decided, okay, let's I'm gonna take a stab at this. You know, I was working in the again working really long hours, 80 hours plus a week, and and I was a production office assistant. I really didn't have a lot of time to kind of devote to it. So I I first wrote with a writing partner, Philip Chung. And he and I started to set about trying to um, come up with some ideas for the show and maybe write a, a spec of Lois and Clark. Oh, cool. I do want to spend just a minute on Lois and Clark because I absolutely love that series. <laughs> um, <laughs> as I, I'm sure, I mean, they're, they're, and like you said, when you're a Superman fan, something like that comes and it was just gold. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we, the Superman movies were big in the um, 80s and 90s, and or sorry, in the 70s and 80s. And then um, the 90s came and that was it for Superman. So... Um, so you, you were a, a production office assistant. So what, what were your duties? And, and I mean, because that was your first, um, uh, after the, your experience with Oliver, Oliver Stone and Wild Palms, um, like this was still a very new experience for you. So what was that like? This was different for sure. I mean, I, being mostly on the set of Wild Palms, I get to see that part of it. And now working in the production office, that's kind of the hub of, of all the, the big action. I mean, I, you know, of course, did did a lot of the entry level stuff, like you know, putting getting together food for pr production meetings and and um, a lot of photocopying things. But eventually, my my duties branched out. I worked there for three seasons all told, and I went up to assistant production coordinator, and I kept thinking, okay, maybe I should 
you know, be a production coordinator while the writing thing, I can keep trying to do the writing thing. But production coordinating is, it's a very difficult job and it's, and it's kind of unheralded because you're juggling 30 balls at any given time. You know, if one drops, everything goes haywire. But if you do juggle, juggle all 30 balls and successfully, people just don't really notice, you know, so it's a, it's a hard job, but you're, I mean, you're, you're constantly keeping track of this, you know, the schedules and making phone calls and, at the time before, oh, this is before emailing and everything, which makes me sound 100 years old, but this, we had to phone call people all the time. We couldn't just, you know, text them and say, show up at this time for your call time and things like that. So mm-hmm. there are, there are a lot of just juggling to get, you know, we've made a lot of the phone calls to get the actors in to their call times and just a lot of distribution of things, especially being on a lot like Warner Brothers. There are a lot of people that need to have all this information, every schedule that comes out. So one of my jobs was to, to basically go around to, all these different offices at Warner Brothers and pass out all of our different forms, you know, the call sheets and shooting schedules and, and all these different um, lists. So that job was great because I met a lot of people. I got to know a lot of different people on the Warner Brothers lot. Plus just being on the set so much, I, I was there pretty much from up until wrap time every day. And, you know, we would go pretty late on that show, but I got mm-hmm. to know the actors pretty well. And to have that kind of experience of be able to go down the set and just kind of watch what's going on, and get to know things from that aspect was was really beneficial. I, I don't re- regret it at all. Oh, that that is so so neat. And and I imagine, wow, the pre email experience must have been amazing for getting to know everybody. Yeah, I know it was. Yeah, you, you just you really was. You know, talking to so many people, and and they would call up the, the office a lot of times just for whatever they needed. So Dean Kane and Terry Hatcher, we got along very very well, and I, I you know I loved kind of being feeling like a part of something, especially over you know those few years I was on there. You know, it was a, it was a fun group of people. I, I still run into a lot of them nowadays, and especially for me being my first job, I was always the young one. You know, it's just funny to come out of college and work in an environment like that, and and uh, I absorbed so much. And this is also where I started, you know, getting into writing. And and amazingly enough, especially now that I look back on it from my perspective now, um, I end up selling a story to the show, which was um, that was a great launch pad too. Very very cool. So that that was um, with Philip Chung, or that was just your own? Yes. That was with Philip. So he and he and I, the, the, the kind of quick story on that is he and I came up with the, uh, an episode. We we wrote a whole you know, specs sample of the show, and I still didn't know how everything worked in uh, TV. So I just, you know, again, the youthful naivete. I kept thinking, well, if I just write a good script and just give it to one of the producers, they'll just buy it, and maybe we can film it. <laughs> <laughs> so this is twenty-two year old me talking, you know. Uh-huh. And so, um, you know, we wrote one, and then. There were, you know, a few of the writers would come into the production office and hang out. We had the food there, so of course that's where people like to hang out. Mm-hmm. One of the producers I hit it off with, John McNamara, mm-hmm. he would just hang out in the office a lot, and and um, I liked his writing a lot. I respected him you know, very much, and so I just kind of s- subtly started stalking him. You know, I would I'd say, uh, <laughs> you know, oh, I'm working on an idea, and it's like, you know, yeah, great kid kind of thing. And um, but I just I wouldn't relent. You know, I just kept saying, you know, I have a script. Would you read it? And yeah, so he said he would, you know, very nicely, and and so we finished it and gave it to him, and you know, sat there for a while. He was very busy on the show, and and then um, one day he actually called me in his office and said, "Hey, I really liked what you guys did, and uh, why don't you come in and pitch some more ideas to me?" Oh wow! So that was that was great, and we we didn't have much time. He he had a slot coming up, and and said, you know, basically, I think we had about a weekend, maybe three days. And so um, I forget how many ideas we came up with, maybe five or six different ideas. And, and um, Philip and I pitched them to him, and he sparked to one of them. So he we he had us write up kind of a an outline of where we thought the story would go, and and um, we did. And then he ended up writing it, and we got story credit, and it was produced, and that was just fantastic. It was a lot of fun, and they they made me feel so included too. I mean, they I, I was an extra on that episode. Oh, neat! Yeah, you know, got to hang out in the set and. In between trying to do my other duties and stuff, uh-huh. so, but um, it was a great experience. It was just, you know, again though, with um, not really knowing how anything worked in the business. Mm-hmm. Of course, I, of course, I thought when it, after it was on the air, I thought, well, now you know, the, the world's my oyster. Of course, I'll get <laughs> agents. Agents will call me and want to represent me and everything, even though I had a shared story credit on the show. You know, uh-huh. so that was my first little wake up call to like, okay, you got to be more than that. <laughs> uh-huh. Wow, that is just a fun story. Um, and uh, you know, I think it does bear mentioning that what. What you thought of as youthful naivete, um, what happens, I think, when we when we hear too many stories of what to do, we can start to think that's the only way. Yeah. But when you have the youthful naivete, you just think, I, you're not even thinking of, of of bending the rules or going against the rules because you don't know the rules. You might try something right. that nobody else is trying. 
no, it definitely helps. I think people should approach it almost like that. And just also the, just the nature of just not giving up until you get what you want. I think that's just part of this business. And I, I know that friends that I've had since when I very first started trying to get in this business, the, the ones that have just dug their nails in and not given up no matter what, they do find a place eventually, I, I believe. Yeah, it could be a long road. And my road was, was very long and winding, but there's no one way to get there. But people have to realize that sometimes they don't. They just think, oh, well, I tried and it didn't happen. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and also I think it does bear mentioning as well, um, a lot, a lot, a lot of people who are starting out talk about how they, they, they want to go to film school because, and, and a very valid point, um, I, I went to film school and a lot of the people now 20 years later that are, are helping me get work um, are people that I knew from, from film school. Um, but it, it, it's a very valid point that even though you did go to, to college for this, what I hear you saying is, is this person that I met on that show, that person I met on that show, you, you made a lot of that networking as you worked and actually got paid for it. So yes. somebody could come into the business, um, and just get a job as an intern and not have to pay oodles of money for, for school, but be making a lot of these same kinds of connections. No, that's entirely true. And I, I, I always, it's, it's hard because I get a lot of people that would ask me, you know, um, they're just trying to get started the business and it's hard because I don't, I would never recommend anyone not to, <laughs> to go to college and to get a degree because I think you just, you just have to have it now. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I have to tell them that if you want to be in the entertainment business, you know, as a writer, director, you know, someone on the set, you don't need a film degree. I mean, that's not going to get anyone a job. The, the fact that you got a degree in film, it's really just what have you done? And luckily, I sensed that when I was in college, and I kept thinking, you know, I mean, at the time, I know nowadays there's there's a lot more equipment available for for colleges for people to make real films, and enough and there's enough at people in people's home computers to make you know decent movies. Mm -hmm. I think that at the time, you know, I didn't have much to go in college that I could really use where our equipment was outdated, and it was, I just kept going, you know, what, I just really want the real experience for this, and that really did launch everything. From my college days, I have some friends, but I don't have any one that ever helped me out. And even at USC, the people I had met, I've never seen them again in the business. I really feel like you need the college experience just to kind of set your sights on which direction you want to go in and you kind of use that time to hone in on which area you might want to concentrate on. But other than that, it's it's really just digging your nails in the carpet and just not you know, letting up until you get what you want. I mean, you know, for instance, at the Lois and Clark thing, that, that launched everything because, you know, just for me going around to the different buildings and passing out all these forms from Lois and Clark, the first um, hiatus we had, after that first season, I got a job in the main production area where all the television executives were in Warner Brothers. Wow! And I and I worked as a as a PA for them, and so the, you know again that really helped me. Just I got to know all the the high up executives and worked for them. So you know, that was really great. And I learned more from there. I, I just felt like everywhere I went, I just was absorbing everything I could. And then to top it off, someone I met on Lois and Clark, Maria Hilton. Her name is. She worked for one of our producers. She ended up taking a job with the actor Kevin Pollack as his assistant when he was doing a television pilot. And it was through her that I they ended up meeting my, my who would be my next boss for the next three years after Lois and Clark. Wow. Um, who was, um, he's the writer Christopher McQuarrie, or Usual Suspects. And he was, you know, he wrote that pilot that was called The Underworld. And it was because of that I jumped off Lois and Clark and started working for him. So, you know, again, it was just who I'd met and, and how I could kind of utilize those um, resources, you know. Very, very cool. Well, we do have to start skipping ahead a little bit because I know everybody's going to love hearing about CSI, NCIS, and all that sort of thing. But we do have to kind of figure out how you got from one to the other. So so maybe just pretty quickly, can you tell me about um, – because CSI was, was more towards 2000, 2001. Yeah. Um, so what was in between? And I, I know you also did a, a – you wrote an indie film, Border to Border, in that time. Yeah, I mean the the quick answer to that is that with when I worked for Chris McQuarrie, he was you know a feature writer and and that that job was very freeing because he you know it was mostly personal stuff for him. I had a lot of time that I could write actually. It was nice every morning he he slept in so every morning I could I had time to write and work on my own stuff. And at the time there was this the independent film was called Border to Border and some other friends that I had from Warner Brothers they decided to make a movie and. So different people from different areas at Warner Brothers kind of got together and they already found a script and they were starting to shoot it and. The director, Tom Whelan, he came to me and said, Corey, I know, you know you're a writer and I think you're funny. That was all my credits. That, that was all that got me this job was that um, he knew me and that I wanted to write and that I was funny. That's what he said. <laughs> Sometimes you can get jobs like that. But um, he said, you know, we have this project and I think the script really needs a rewrite. Can you come on board? And at first I was kind of hesitant. I'm like, okay, you know how these things come and go. But 
uh, he had such great ex- exuberance about this project. And, and so I spent a nine month period just rewriting this movie and being involved with this thing that we shot in, I think, four different states and Mexico. I mean, it, we went on weekends and, and uh, any time we could grab. And it was, a, wow. it was a really fun experience. But that kind of, again, just more experience in, in that. And, but these, there was a three years after Lois and Clark between that and CSI that that um, that was just kind of trying to me finding ways to get writing jobs. I was hoping that the independent film would get me some stuff, and it did. I, I got some rewrites on different little independent features and things like that. Just enough money to kind of keep me motivated, keep me going. Um, I would do rewrites and weekends for a couple hundred bucks in cash, you know, things like that. Wow. Anything that would come up. And that also got me um, interest from a manager who um, he got me a legitimate job on a on an independent feature called Beyond City Limits that I worked on briefly. But, um, you know, just things like that. I just kept trying to meet everyone I could. And, and so the, I guess like, the turning point was right, right around, it was the year 2000. And I had worked trying to do some stuff with features and it was just a really hard road. And I, at some point I went, okay, my money's kind of lacking right now. And so I, I thought, you know, I, 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 as much as I don't want to do it, I, I really need, and I was married at the time. I'm still married, but I was already married. <laughs> but um, I, I, kept, I kept going, you know, I had to make some steady income. So, you know, ironically, that was that was when I started looking for a job. And, and I'll, you know, I had used all my contacts from all, those, all the different years I'd worked and had a lot of interviews. And just the one that I had that was just kind of interesting to me was CSI. I met with, and again, this was from a contact, you know, guy I worked with on, on Lois and Clark, who um, at the time I said, hey, I'm looking for work. He said, well, you know, a friend of mine said that there's a, writer's assistant job opening on this new show. They'd only had a pilot and they, they were just about to, to gear up to start filming. Wow. So it was before it just hit and exploded. Yeah, no, this was, um, this was right when they were starting about to shoot the first episode of CSI. Wow. It wasn't on the air yet. So I said, okay, writer's assistant, you know, that's good. That's why I wanted to kind of at least be in the writer, writing department now. So, um, I just drove up to Santa Clarita, you know, it's far away. It's almost like the desert, but, uh, I drove up there and met with Carol Mendelson. It turned out it wasn't for just a writer's assistant job. It was assistant to the showrunner. Okay. So I didn't know that at the time. So when I walked in, I met Carol Mendelson, who's run the show from, you know, from pretty much the beginning. She didn't create it, but she um, supervised the pilot. Anthony Zeiker created it. Mm-hmm. And I met with her. We hit it off. And then I just went home going, I wasn't sure about the money. And I kind of wanted to get paid more. But then um, I read the script and I just I thought, wow, this is really, I really liked the script. I thought it was interesting. And I thought, you know what, just, just go for it. I, I told my wife uh, famously, I said, you know, it'll probably get canceled in three months and I'll be, be back looking for something else, but at least it's a nice income for now. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But, um, cause, you know, it was, it was, uh, it was going to be on Friday nights at nine. I kept thinking that's not, you know, a very glamorous time slot. And, but that kind of began my, my little, my run on CSI, which, um, you know, I couldn't have asked for a more incredible opportunity than that when, you know, it was, you never know. That's, you know, just uh, out of all the things that have come up around that time. Just CSI kind of sparked to me, and and then you know I ended up being in that CSI world for eight and a half years. Wow, wow. So so you were an assistant to the showrunner, and um and it was during that point that you got to um, write a couple of uh, freelance scripts, right? Yes, I, I um the second season of CSI came up, and you know Carol knew that I wanted to write, and, and she was from the beginning you know, she's she always fosters new talent and she's always keeping her eye out for people that are you know hungry to do it and she knew i wanted to write so my first one was kind of an audition script i paired up with mark Duby, who was assisting Ann donahue another executive producer on the show and he and i wrote an episode second season together then that led to another one the, the following season i got my solo to write it was all baby steps it was just kind of letting you learn and letting you grow and the great thing about csi at the beginning was we were so under the radar that and no one called. No one really called the office very much. So really, I got to, yeah, no. So I got to sit in on the writers' room, and when I was assisting Carol, and I mean, literally, the phone rang a few times a day or something, and we just kept the phone there. And if we were in the writers' room, and then the phone rang, I would just duck out for a minute. But um, wow, it was, it was so quiet there for you know the whole first season, pretty much. Now, was it actually written up in Santa Clarita? Yeah, that, the very first, uh, the first couple seasons, we were up there. Interesting. Yeah, there was two different office spaces that that were there, but. The, the very first office that we had there was this old Lockheed plant. It was very bizarre. It was kind of in the middle of nowhere. And there were deer running around, and that's where you know we had this big. This, the writers' room was very funny. It was this little tiny space, but then right outside it was this almost um, this cavernous room where all the writers had their offices. And you know, if you talked to the middle of the room, it'd echo. And it was, oh, cool. Yeah, really bizarre. But we were definitely um, under the radar for a long time. And this right when the when CSI Miami came to fruition, then things kind of got a lot busier. And so I, my job with Carol got more intense. And so I, I was not able to go to the room as much, but 
at that point, that's when Carol gave me my solo script and, and that kind of cemented it, you know, for me to get my chance to, to do something a little more of my own. And, you know, they, again, they were great with, with fostering that. And, and then, you know, one thing just led to another, I, you know, I ended up being her assistant for the first three seasons. And at that point I did those two freelances and then CSI Miami was finishing up its first season. They had kind of a rocky road with different showrunners that were coming and going. And, and as their season was about to wrap up, Carol liked the job I did on, on my, my solo freelance on CSI and said, you know, we could use your kind of voice on CSI Miami. Would you do a freelance for that? And that was that was that first season. Very cool. That was great too. I I almost segued right from one to the other, and that's when I kind of segued out of the job working for Carol. Mm-hmm. I found a replacement for myself, and and I just decided, you know, I loved working for her, but it was time to to not be an assistant anymore and just dedicate myself to writing now. And you know, luckily that all worked out. Um, after I did my freelance for CSI Miami that first season, then Anne Donahue from CSI she decided to to kind of branch off or move off to um, CSI Miami and run that show. And she asked me to um, to write over there. So that's when I became a writer in CSI Miami. So so did you actually write in Miami? No. <laughs> that's funny. We never – we shot there a few times uh, at the beginning of the show. We'd go there three times a year just to shoot usually the, the season opener and usually at the finale and then one point in between. Mm-hmm. But we never wrote there. We would just travel there a few times a year. When we went, first started CSI Miami, we were based in um, Manhattan Beach. Mm-hmm. At, at, at this um, funky little office space. And we ended up moving to the Manhattan Beach Raleigh Studios lot um, where David Kelly has his shows, or used to rather. So for six years, the six seasons that I, I was on staff on that show, we were based in Manhattan Beach. Now, this is, this is when you got your first agent, which, which seems a little interesting to, to me because you had already written two um, freelance scripts for CSI and you had already written these <laughs> yeah. independent features and, and um, you, you had co-written... Or got story credit on Lewis and Clark. So, so tell me a little bit about like. So, did you just hire a lawyer to negotiate those deals, or how did that work? It was really rough to, for me to get an agent. It was hard. I mean, there were so many things that I would just, you know, people I contacted that a lot of people that just weren't coming through. And you know, there was, like I said, there was a, a guy that represented me or wanted to represent me really quickly. He was working at I think the old Endeavor. Mm-hmm agency as an assistant he was going to get bumped up and he, he represented me getting me this one job on independent feature and i thought okay well maybe he'll be the guy but then you know he ended up leaving endeavor and then i never heard from him again you know there's just a lot of things like that that were it's it's hard enough to do your own thing but let alone keep track of all these other people and what they're doing mm-hmm. because they have to keep their jobs too <laughs> yeah but um no i didn't have an agent it, it was kind of remarkable to me because when um I wrote my first CSI, the, that one I, I shared credit with. It was uh, number one for the week of that of that <laughs> week, and, and I said, you know what? It's only downhill from here, first of all. But um, <laughs> but um, that was all without an agent. There wasn't much to negotiate, honestly. I mean, it's pretty standard script rate, so it's not mm-hmm. like you, you, there's anything that an agent could have done for me. I mean, there were a lot of jobs that I I just you know I had to just get for myself. And there, Nick Holly was the first agent that that ever. Um, Kind of found me and, and became my my agent for a while. He was at Don Buckwald and Associates mm-hmm. at the time, and and but that didn't come around until my um, CSI Miami freelance was was actually written and kind of circulating. Mm-hmm. So somehow I did I did two CSIs without really landing an agent. Wow. <laughs> uh, I, I feel like um, for some reason again CSI was very popular, but it still had took a little while for it to kind of catch on in this in the industry as far as like being recognized as a solid success and things. And, you know, I always had a lot of people circling, but there was there was never anyone I liked enough to kind of go for or anyone that worked out enough to kind of go forward from that. But, you know, as soon as you know, Nick had found me, a couple other people had come up, and I finally started doing the um, interviewing different agents and things like that. And I really liked Nick, and I, I really honored the fact that he was kind of the first person to truly step up and had asked for other samples of mine that I'd written and said, I want to represent you. So I was with him for a few years and, until um, – he left to become a manager, mm-hmm. and then I moved to United Talent Agency. Wow! So um, it's it's interesting because so many um, wannabe writers and writers who are starting out are so focused on finding an agent and um, and sweating about the fact that they can't. I think this needs to encourage people that even somebody who's actually writing for a show can have trouble <laughs> finding an agent. So don't worry about that. Just worry about yourself finding a job, right? No, I, I agree, and I, I think that you should really worry about just having enough scripts that you've written. You know, I think a lot of people just can't wait to finish a script and try to get it to someone, but you really need a lot more than that. I mean, even after my first CSI was done, and, and I, there was a time where right around I did my second CSI that I had gone out to try to interview on getting on shows, and mm-hmm. 
unfortunately, I found out that even though I did work, to, I did a CSI, I had split it with someone else, and so they didn't know who did what, so it was almost useless as a sample. Wow. But um, I, I'd written a good number of samples, and I had that writing partner only for Lois and Clark, and then we did a couple other things together. But after I decided to kind of just make sure, just branch out on my own and just be solo writer, I had a few samples of my own, and almost any time I went on an interview, it always seemed like they always wanted the thing I didn't have. Oh, no. And, you know, I had a six feet under spec, and I had some half hour sitcom specs, and I had an original pilot that I'd written. It was always the one thing I didn't have. Oh, you don't have a, you know, soprano spec, or you don't have a kind of crime procedural spec, or whatever it was. You know, they, mm-hmm. I, I think instead of people concentrating on trying to get an agent so much, just make sure you have all your bases covered. You know, have mm-hmm. all the writing samples that you need to show, to really show someone what you are. Don't give them a reason to say no. I, I won't read your stuff, you know. Yeah. Well, and I've heard somebody could have an amazing spec, but they'll they'll get passed over because somebody else has nine specs. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it's so hard because you have to find that right person at the right time to have all the stars align. But, you know, I, I really feel like even though it took me a, a while to get to that point, then when the stars did align, it was I was ready for it, you know. Mm-hmm. So you were on CSI Miami, what, five years? I was I was a full-time writer for six seasons. Six seasons, wow. Yeah. And uh, and so obviously with with TV writing you gradually move up the ranks. You you went up to what? Uh, I was supervising producer when I left. Supervising producer, okay. And then uh, you also worked on NCIS Los Angeles, um, and The Forgotten, and Body of Proof. Um, these are all pretty recent. What can you tell me about these shows? The quick story is that you know after after six years, you know, and eight and a half years in total, like I said on CSI, it was great. I mean, I wrote. I wrote or co-wrote 22 episodes in that time on CSI Miami, and I got to do two CSIs. And I loved writing them, and I got to do so many fun things. But it was kind of time just for me as a writer to, to try to do something new. And, and so after my second contract was up, I talked to Ann Donahue, and I said, you know, I, I love you guys and, it's, you know, this experience, but I think I'm, I just need to write something else, write new characters at least, you know. Mm-hmm. So um, she, you know, she blessed that, and I thought, okay, I need a new sample. I, You know, I've been in this bubble for so long. I hadn't written anything new, so I thought I'm going to go. I to need to write a write a new pilot. So I, at, at night after a, you know working long hours and on the show and stuff, I I started every night just kind of writing maybe 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. or whatever you know, I could get however long I could last. Mm-hmm. And um, for a period of, of a couple of months, I I wrote a spec script and everything kind of worked out. Just when I was you know finishing up my last episode of, of CSI Miami that I was going to do, knowing that I was about to leave, the um, spec that I wrote started getting some attention and. I actually sold it, so it was um, that was great. So it was kind of um, just comforting to kind of know that I okay, I, I, I first of all that I can write something else besides CSI. Cause I hadn't done it so long, <laughs> but I sold it to the Peter Chernin company and worked with Catherine Pope on it. And that was an amazing experience just to um, to kind of go through that. It it was a it was a funny process because it was a spec that was already written, you know, that was just sold that way, and then. I had to kind of go through the development process with Fox to kind of like put the script aside and kind of pitch it in different ways that that more fit their network and things. And, mm-hmm. um, it we did, it didn't get shot, but um, it was a great experience for that. And then I had some time off. I you know be, I was so used to this is the opposite of um, what a lot of people have to go through when they don't know their shows are coming back. I mean, I was blessed to know for all those years that I always knew that I would you know get to do another 24 episodes on the show the following year for you know all those years wow so i i, I kind of felt the opposite of what most people feel i i kind of felt like you know what? i wouldn't mind some unpredictability for a while <laughs> and and so i didn't staff on a show that first year i just kind of decided to work in my pilot and then just um kind of take some time i have young kids and i thought this is a great time to kind of just be around a little bit more and kind of live life again and and so Things were a little more sporadic, you know. A few months had gone by, and I, after uh, I got a call suddenly and saying, you know, I worked with the Jerry Bruckheimer folk on CSI that they wanted some help on the Forgotten. They were just wrapping up the last five episodes of their season, and they had some personnel changes, and and so they said, would you, you know, would you like to meet on this? And I met the showrunner Mark Friedman, and who I'd kind of known socially, and so that just kind of came up from that reason, and that was you know a great experience just to kind of jump into a show that everyone was already established, and you know. Mm-hmm. I just helped on the last five, getting the stories out, and I wrote one of those, and that finished up. It didn't come back, and then, and then I was off work again, and and then um, Shane Brennan, who runs um, NCIS and NCIS Los Angeles, I worked with him for a year on CSI Miami. He was on the on our staff mm-hmm. um, that first season. He called me up and said, "Hey, I hear you off work. Would you like to write an episode for us?" <laughs> oh, cool. So, so I said, "Yeah, hey, let's, let's go for it." So um, that was fun. I just went to you know Paramount and worked on the story with those guys and wrote one of those and. 
So it was it, that stuff was you know, just kind of fun to jump into something totally new and and you work on it and then it's done. And then I went through the usual staffing season process. Actually, for the first time again, funny. Oh well. Funny enough, after all these years of working, I I kind of got my own jobs and then um, I got to this point where okay, now I'm out there and uh, looking for work. So I um, interviewed a lot of different shows and another friend of mine, Sunil Nair, who worked, I worked with for years on, on CSI Miami. He um, was a showrunner of the show Body of Proof and, mm-hmm. and said, I know, I know it's another procedural, but we want to do more character, you know? So we talked about that. I met the other, the creator, Chris Murphy and, and Matt Gross, the, the, the other creator and executive producer and, and just really liked the guys. And so I jumped on Body of Proof and we did 13 episodes, which they just started airing and we've aired three of them so far. Great. But just a great experience. And, and then, even though I'm, you know, honing my procedural muscles again, it's a different show in a lot of ways. I mean, CSI, we would never really go home with the characters and you kind of experience all the characters through work. Mm-hmm. But um, in the case of Body of Proof, Dana Delaney's character is a, it's a lot of fun to write for. She's just kind of messed up. And she, even though she's in her, you know, in her 40s, she's kind of rediscovering herself and so all that part's been uh been fun to, to kind of work on mm-hmm. now um maybe we could talk about that for a second do you do you worry about being sort of typecast as a procedural writer um, i had those fears yes but i think because the sample that i wrote and sold is called lost angels my, mm-hmm. my um, pilot that was that was a lot different and so that already gave me a lot more opportunities when staffing season came around because people responded well to that script and it wasn't a procedural and you know it was a it was a character drama mm-hmm. with, there was some, um, procedural element elements to it. I didn't want to go too far afield when I wrote my first spec, but, um, there's always that, that fear that people will, you know, will think of you a certain way. But I, again, everything comes back. At least writers always have themselves to, to count on. They can always write other samples. You know, they, you, you don't have to be typecast because all you have to do is show someone that you don't need to be, you know. And so I think having the other samples, if you, you know, if anyone's ever in a genre that they're afraid they might be typecast and just write something in a different one and prove that, you know, that you can do other things. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, there are plenty of, of shows that, that met with me based, just based off my spec. You know, they, some people didn't want to, they don't care about CSI or whatever it was. Some people, they were really excited about the CSI part and didn't care about the other part. So it just depends on the job. And, but if you can prove you can write other things, I don't think you have to worry about it so much. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and let's, let's talk a little bit about the different rooms. Um, you worked for a few different showrunners now, and I've, I've heard that there's could be wild difference, differences between them. I, I mean, I, I heard from a law and order writer, that they they don't even have a writer's room. Yeah. Um. And then then it runs the gamut to other shows where everything is written in the room. Um. What were uh, the differences between these shows in that respect? I think the, the CSI both the CSI shows are run in a, a similar manner because both Carol Mendelson and Ann Donahue kind of grew up in the same school, so to speak, of mm-hmm. of um just having a, a strong room and then fostering that that talent in that room and then. And which was another great thing about CSI is you get to go off and produce your own episodes and everything, but they had the same kind of philosophy on that. So I was curious when I went to other shows for sure to see what the kind of philosophy of the room was. And I haven't had a very different um, experience. Not, I've never been on a show without a room. First of all, mm-hmm. there are some days where I, I would think, wow, that'd be amazing, you know, <laughs> because there are definitely times where the room can get you down when you, you, you know, there's a lot of voices in a room and you just want some silence and go into your writer's zone. But mm-hmm. I think the only show that I worked on that did not have a room was the NCIS. Mm-hmm. They have a room that kind of was off and on, but it was towards the end of the season and, and a lot of people were doing other things. So that was kind of unique just in the sense of, and plus my episode in NCIS LA was the second of a two-parter. Oh, interesting. So they had to kind of, yeah, they had to kind of work out the first part of it first and then, and then I had to jump in on mine. So I didn't really have a lot of, a lot of time, which was almost um, kind of a fun challenge because I was just almost waiting around for them to figure out what the part one was hmm. um, in order to know what I needed to do. And then plus some things would change in part one in the script writing phase that then uh, I would have to incorporate. So um, even though I went in there to kind of talk with the writers in a general sense about what the episode might be, that quickly dissolved. And then I was just kind of um, waiting to hear from them. And Scott Gemmel and um, Shane, you know, I'd go in there and meet with them and they would say, OK, we're thinking about this. And they gave me some very general guidelines and then started to hone in more and more as it went along. So I guess um, my response to your question is just um, I haven't had a lot of different experiences. The the main different experiences, I guess, are just the vibes of the different rooms mm-hmm. and, and also how you approach a, a writer's room, depending on kind of what your level is on the show. Cause I, I, feel, I don't know. I feel like it took me a little bit of time to kind of, when I first was in a writer's room, when I first started in CSI Miami to kind of, you know, I'm a staff, I was a staff writer and, and you, you almost want to kind of ride the wave 
where other people are kind of coming up with the, the broad strokes of stories and you want to almost be the one that helps to hone things or to bring up stuff and not get in the way. Mm-hmm. And then as you kind of rise up the ranks and, you know, and then run a room, which, you know, many times in many episodes, I was running the room on CSI or, or um, in body of proof, depending on who who's available or not available. Then you kind of realize that you have to kind of you know, create the wave and everyone, you know, you have to kind of steer. Oh, I don't know. I'm making a lot of random metaphors, but you have, kind of, you have to kind of be the one steering the ship and other people need to kind of jump on board. So there are, there are a lot of different vibes that you just have to ride at the time and, and, and feel it out. You know, it's a very unique environment. And, and one person could be gone out of your eight writers and, and the vibe is different. Sometimes you might do a room where there's only, you know, three people left because like I said, in CSI, there were, there's always someone on set. There's always someone writing. There's always someone in post-production editing. So a lot of times you'd be down to bare bones in the writer's room. So mm. it's just, you have to just be really kind of very adaptable to, to um, different personalities. And also, you know, if you don't have that many people, you just have to know when to step up and, and say, this is what I want to do. And, you know, then just kind of get vetted by your bosses through that whole process. Very, very cool. So, so what's next? I mean, you, you had that time off and you were writing a pilot of a different genre and, and uh, you're um, you're not locked into a, a long running show like CSI Miami now. Um, what would you like to do in the in the coming years? I want to work with really good people. I, I think I went. I've gone back and forth in in my life and career. And you know, I think again, I was so lucky to be on a show for so long, kind of right out of the gate. So I, my problems were different than other people who were just trying to stick on a show. You know. Mm-hmm. So I mean, I just want to have good experiences and good times. I don't. You know, the Body of Proof group was, was just so fantastic. And, you know, knock on wood, we'll, if we get a second season, I'd be happy to come back and get, get a chance to, to, you know, explore that character some more. But, you know, I always have a lot of ideas for, for my own shows. And I, I, I do think, um, you know, when the time's right, that I can get my own show going. And I'd, I'd love to run my own show and just try different genres. You know, I love to, I just love exploring characters. And, you know, whether it's a half hour format or an hour format, I, I've done both. And I, you know, I like to, um, I just like to do a lot of stuff with, with humor and I, on CSI that ended up being a lot of black humor, but, um, mm-hmm. you know, I just want to keep varying it and working with great people. That's my, my biggest goal at this point. Very, very cool. Well, our, our last section here will be advice for writers trying to break in. And I, I know we've covered a lot of different things and there's a lot of great wisdom that, that people I'm sure can pull already. But if you had just one or two nuggets of things that you, you say, if you want to break in, you really should do this. What would that be? Um, I think I had two basic ones, and the first one is if you're in college, if you're you're young, try to get an internship. I just think that those are so important to get you started, to get you get you a lot of contacts, and also if you can get a job as a as a reader as an intern, that's fantastic because you get to read, 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 and just absorb everything you can. Because the more knowledge you have of what scripts are are, are out there in the marketplace and what's being bought, you know, you shouldn't write what people. Or, or buying because that's always a bad sign. You know, you should just write what you really want to write, but internships are fantastic. And my other piece of advice is just don't give anyone a reason to say no, you know, don't mm. give them a reason not to want to see your stuff or, you know, like I said, always, always have a few varied samples. And I think it's very important nowadays more than ever to have original work. You know, at, when I was kind of growing up in the business, so to speak, I, the biggest thing was having spec samples of all these produced shows. And I, whereas it's still important I don't think it's as, as important as it used to be. I think people want to see your original voice. And so I think you should always have at least one original pilot to work with so people can read. And then, you know, then from there, start doing some spec samples of other shows, you know, to kind of show how varied your talents are. Very, very cool. Well, I think we will wrap it up there. You've been very generous with your time, and, and I, I really, really appreciate it. Uh, boy, it's it's been quite a ride for you, but it, I, I've really enjoyed coming along with you on that ride. It was it was great to talk to you with you. Thank, thanks for uh, thanks for suggesting it. Very very cool. And uh, best of luck to you. I, I do hope Body of Proof is is renewed because I know that's always a great thing to uh, to come back once you've worked all, out all the season one um, bugs. And um, yeah. but if not, I'm sure um, you're you're the type of person you're going to find some great stuff to to do. So thanks so much, Greg. Appreciate it. Hey, thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye. Hosted by Gray Jones, the TV Writer Podcast is brought to you by Script Magazine and ScriptMag.com, the leading source for script writing information in print and on the web. And by Final Draft Script Writing Software, the entertainment industry standard for script writing worldwide. <laughs>